So I hope some of you might recognise where we are today. Uh, we are stood just outside the Hook Northern Brewery in the village of the same name in North Oxfordshire. Um, some of you may be familiar with the beers, some of you may even have visited here before. And today we're going to take a little look round, but we're going to take a slightly different look round in that rather than focus on the lovely beer, we're actually going to focus on some of the building and the architecture and the machinery um, throughout the building. This follows really um, watching a Michael Portillo program. Some of you may have seen he came here seven or eight years ago. Uh, watching one of his programs, he was at a mill in the northwest of England and a very interesting tour around the architecture. Some of that very much resonated with what we have here. So today we're going to spend a short time having a look at the building. So come with me. So the first thing I hope you'll clearly notice is it's a tower brewery. It rises to six floors and the purpose of that was to try and use gravity as far as possible. So purely the height alone makes it have a really big visual impact. Um, and if you start at the top, um, you'll see some white panels at the very top there. That's actually the outsides of cast iron water tanks that hold the water or liquor from the wells beneath the brewery, pump right up to the top, and then use gravity as far as possible to distribute throughout the building. If we come down slightly to the left, you'll see some more white um, parts there are actually wooden louvers which were used to open up to allow some of the vapours from the hot brew to escape. You'll see the building is of stone construction and all of that stone was quarried locally about two miles away. Um, the windows you may notice they have metal construction and we'll have a closer look at some of these details as we go around inside. Um, and the building just immediately in front of us again you'll see some louvers at top of that and that's where the product is boiled up so the louvers would allow the vapors to escape um, and also the slates laid on top of that building they're not butted up right next to each other between each of the slates is a small gap to further allow some of the vapors and the steam to escape from the building so we're now still closer to the brewery it's towering above us it rises about 80 feet and the top of the brewery is nearly 800 feet above sea level. In front of us there's another cast iron tank and this is for the spent grain. So after the um, goodness has been taken out of the malt, the barley, to give the sugars for the beer, um, that spent grain then goes off as a cattle feed. So it's taken out of the mash tun in the brewery and into this cast iron tank. Um, and originally there was a measure here which would measure by the bushel. Now a bushel is a measurement of volume rather than weight and local farmers would come and buy a certain proportion of bushels of this spent grain to feed their pigs and cattle. And then above and running up the side of the building, two thirds up the side of the building, you'll see the black and white wooden construction almost sort of bolted on the outside. And that's actually a lift hoist. So the reason that the bracing and the construction is on the outside of the hoist is so that on the inside, it's much smoother without the encumbrances. So when we're hoisting sacks of grain up into the brewery, they were less likely to get caught on the side um, because originally all of the grain used on this site was in sacks. So you have barley in sack, that would be malted and then again stored in sack and the sacks would be moved into the brewery. So this would have been a really busy piece of machinery. So important that the sacks didn't get ripped or snagged as we were bringing them up inside the building. As we've just walked up and started looking, we've been, uh, struck really by the, the, the great presence of the Tower Brewery, but the Tower Brewery is not actually from the beginning. The Tower Brewery was designed in the 1890s and construction ran through from 1894 to 1899, because slightly before that, where the main brewery is now, was a farmhouse. And that's where John Harris moved to in 1846, renting a farm and a few acres of land. Um, the farm included a working malt house. So one of the things he would have been doing was growing barley and malting it so that it could be used for brewing and then supplying other local brew houses. So it was probably natural that he would try to brew with the malt that he was making himself. And he did, but initially it was on a very small scale and would have just been in the outbuildings of the farmhouse itself. A few years after moving here, John Harris actually bought the farm. So in 1852, he bought the freehold outright and that probably gave him a bit more um, control as well. And uh, beer sales must have gone fairly well because he employed the services of an architect to design a small purpose-built brewery. So as in the beginning, say, he'd been brewing very much in the almost the outbuildings, but in 1872, a building was designed um, by a chap called Henry Pontifex, an architect from London. And uh, we believe it was built by local labourers because when we go inside later, 
um, you'll see the design of it and the design is very similar to some other mill and uh, small industrial buildings in the in the local area as well of course it, of course it wasn't just the main dairy building that you needed to actually make the beer there were all sorts of other buildings needed there were cellars there were offices and of course there were stables needed because at that time all the deliveries were being made by horse so the stables still stand and they were one of the first parts of the, the build completed in 1894 and it's lovely that even on these buildings there are actually date stones in the building commemorating that date. So the main materials used in construction were the stone, we saw that outside when we walked up to the building, obviously the slate on the roof, um, but a huge amount of timber was used and most of the timber was dug as fir because that's found to react quite well or not react very much at all to the different humidities. What you don't want is a timber that's going to warp when they because there can be quite high humidity when you're boiling or perhaps when it's in the cooler areas. Um, and then there's lots of metal used. The majority of that is cast iron. And here it's stood next to one of the pillars. Now we're in the basement of the row, so we're right at the bottom, we're actually below the ground level that we walked in on. And um, you'll see here to my left a cast iron column. It's decorative, it's got these rings here, it's got a design here. Um, but this design is replicated throughout the whole of the brewery. So on the top of this, on the floor above, is another column and so on, right the way up to the top. And as we go up, the columns do get narrower because they're gradually taking less weight. So we'll see that as we go through, and hopefully that'll become apparent. So as well as the walls of the road, there's this big um, metal, this cast iron construction as well, or most of it's cast iron. So these columns and the beams here, supporting beams, are made of cast iron. And then apparently these tie beams, because this is a cast vaulted, cast concrete ceiling, these tie beams are actually made of raw time. Uh, we're not quite sure the reasoning why, so if anybody has any suggestions on that, drop us an email, we're always very keen to learn. But this fascinating room is a vaulted ceiling, and originally this room was where the yeast was stored. So this is a cellar, um, for the days of refrigeration, this would have been where the yeast was stored in large open slate trays to try and keep it cool. Just before we leave this uh, cell of this basement area then, I just want to show a bit more. We've looked at some of the metal construction and above us here are some huge cast iron brackets and uh, the reason for those will become apparent when we get up to the ground floor. And also, extremely important, four main ingredients of beer. One of the reasons that the brewery is here and has been successful is because of the natural water supplies available here. And below us is the original well. And if we just film in closely, you might be able to make out in the wall there, you can see an archway. There's actually a wall over the edge of the well, and you can see the original green pipes, and the water will be pumped from this well all the way to the top of the brewery to those big storage tanks that we saw when we were standing outside and looking up. So I'm sure some of you will have guessed, we just looked at those brackets and the ceiling of the cellar below us, those huge uh, cast iron brackets, why they were there, and it's because on top of those six the steam engine. So here's our 25 horsepower steam engine, uh, double acting, so steam pressure both sides of the cylinder, and originally this would have been the motive, source of motive power for the whole of the brewery. <laughs> So motive power was needed for all sorts of things. Uh, in front of us are some pumps. So these are water pumps, positive displacement water pumps that would lift the water from that well we looked at right at the top of the brewery. And if you look at the belt, you'll see that the belt is actually crossed over. Now, as a youngster, I could never quite work out what the reason for this for. It wasn't directional because with a reciprocating pump, it doesn't matter which way round the crankshaft turns. But the reason for crossing the belt is you actually get a greater contact of the belt with the wheels that it's turning because you've got more than 180 degrees and it just helps with efficiency and with grip because these leather belts can have a tendency to slip um, but by just having a bit more in contact with the wheels that were driving and the wheel that was being driven it just helped them to run a bit more efficiently and reliably. So the motor power from the steam engine to be distributed through the brewery was through a range of open gears. And here we've got these huge open gears here, driving right to the top of the brewery, taking us through right angles, and that's the same design all the way to the top. We have an expanding clutch here, 
which is wound in through this red wheel. So you literally wind the clutch out, then it bites and it will take the drive all the way to the top of the brewery. But interestingly, at every point where there are open gears like this, one of the faces actually has the teeth made up individually of timber and horn beam is the timber that's used. So this is one of the wooden teeth. So basically all of the teeth in this cog here are hand cut from horn beam timber. And the idea for that was that the wear was on the wood and also it reduced the risk of any sparks with a metal to metal. Tucked away in the corner of the engine room is something else. And here we have depth gauges. So we've already talked about the water tanks at the very top of the brewery, but to save people's feet, to save wearing out their hobnail boots up and down the brewery all day to check the level of water, in the tank is a float connected to a cable, and that cable runs all the way down over small pulleys to these indicator boards. And here we can see one foot, two foot, three feet, four feet of water, and how many barrels, brewer's barrels, that corresponds to. So you can take this, and that will just settle out the weight balancing with the float 80 feet above us. And that's telling us that we have just over 110 brewer's barrels of water in the tank. So just over three feet, six inches of water sat there. So a really simple design, but again, a great forethought and ingenuity just to make something like measuring the water a much simpler process. So we're now in what's called the brew house. That's the largest building at the front of the brewery, not the main tower, but the big building at the front. And this is where the sweet work, the extract from the mould is boiled up with the hops. And uh, so a boiling process, lots of steam and lots of vapours. Um, you'll see at the top there the louvers to allow those uh, vapours out. And this again is where the slates are not butted up together, but there's a gap between them to allow some further more of that uh, vapour to escape. You see this timber construction, and this is again why the Douglas fir is such a good timber to use, because it's quite resistant to moving. Um, in, in extremes of moisture and humidity. Uh, you may see the main beams running up from the corners of the building and you'll see those red shoes. We'll have a closer look at those in a second where the beams come in just to support all of that construction. Um, but just before we go up there, um, in here we still have an original copper dating back to 1900, no longer used, tucked away there. You can see how it's actually a copper vessel but it's built into a brickwork, so the brickwork was built around and that one would have been directly fired. So underneath there would have been a coal or coke fire and it would have been someone's job to get that fire going, ready to boil the wort up in the middle of the day. And this second copper, this again dates from the, the 1900 from the Tower Brewery, uh, but this one was converted to steam firing. In 1970 we put our first oil fire boiler in. Um, and at the time we've got some steam coils that you can see in the bottom of this, running around the bottom of this copper. Um, and inside is like an upside down funnel, which just helps as the work starts bubbling together. It bubbles up, hits the hat at the top and recirculates itself around. So we've walked in the brewery, we've walked through that main tower brewery. Um, but now as we've come up to the second floor, we've walked into the 1872 brewery, that brewery designed by uh, Henry Pontifex the brewery engineer from London. And you may notice there are lower ceilings here. Uh, there's a lack of cast iron columns because they're smaller rooms. And this is the building that, although it's designed by a brewery architect, the actual building itself is very similar to other buildings in the village. There's a particular farm with a mill on the side of it. It's very similar construction to this. Low ceilings, quite uh, acute angle ladders and steps between the floors. And in the corner of this room, you'll see a malt mill. So a mill for grinding the malt before it was mixed with the hot water in the brewing process. And that's actually a stone mill where you have the two stones in there. The grain will be dropped in from a, into a hopper above and then uh, you moved through the mill. And then once it had been crushed, once it was grist, it was collected and could be brewed with. And that was driven by a small steam engine. So predating the steam engine we, we looked at on the ground floor, um, so this is in the 1872 brewery, but fascinating that when they built the uh, main tower brewery that we see, um, they did use some of the space afforded by the 1872 brewery, and that's, that's where we are now. Back into the William Bradford Tower Brewery on the second floor, and we're now in the malt stores. And you'll see in here now we have sacks of malt, these are all different sorts of malts, some pale malts, some coloured malts, some lovely dark roasted malts, but all of the malt here is in sack. However, that was not the original way that these rooms were used. 
Um, what we had originally here were actually four, five rooms, um, boarded out floor to ceiling with timber, and grain would have been brought to the floor above. So up to the third floor, in sack, and then tipped through the trapdoor here. Each of these bays has its own trapdoor. We were tipped into here, and these rooms were being full of grain from floor to ceiling. So in effect, they were a form of silo, and that they were wooden boxes that grain was stored in. Um, you'll see in front of you again, we're back to the cast iron columns. So this is sat on another column below it, and which is a bit thicker diameter, and another one below that, right down to the basement. And above this, when we go upstairs, we'll see again more cast iron columns on the top. But here we have, say, five bulk malt storage bins where the malt was brought over and stored here. And wood was always quite a good medium to store it in because the wood tends to absorb the moisture. We want to keep our grain quite dry. We don't want any uh, pre-germination or, or, or anything happening. So the wooden box is where it was stored. Um, and then in order to get the grain out, the grain will be taken out in sack. And to do that, we have these wooden slides. So a couple of nice sharp hooks each side, hang a hessian sack on there, lift the slide and grain would fall out into the sack and could then be moved. Once the grain level got down to here, it was safe for men to get in the shovel. Because as you may be aware, um, grain can be very dangerous and you can actually drown in grain. So once the level was down to here, it was then safe for men to get in. And uh, all the men working here would have had boots, but they wouldn't have had hobnail boots. They just had wooden boots and they used wooden shovels as well because we're trying not to break any of the grains, trying to keep the grains intact as we can. So huge amount of timber used in this room, but still got to say that cast iron column construction and this was the main malt store. In front of us here is the steel's masher. And you say, why is it called a steel's masher when it's fairly obviously not made of steel? It's made of copper and it's made of brass. But it's called a steel's masher because it's named after Mr. Steel who patented the design in 1851. Basically what this machine does is it mixes the hot liquor, hot water and crushed grain together before they go into the mash tun where we'll produce our sugars. So it looks like a copper tube. There's a rack and pinion gear because it could serve either of the two mash tuns. So two mash tuns, but only one mashing machine. And hidden inside the tube there are a series of mixers. And this is where his patented design comes in. So through a series of valves and slides, you can see in front of you, there's lots of hand wheels. Um, open up the slides, open up the hot water supply, correct the temperature of a little bit of cold. Um, and then it was all mixed up inside this copper tube and it runs into the mash tun and it looks and smells a bit like a nice healthy porridge. So the Steel's Masher patented design remained fairly unchanged for well over 100 years and it's still a really efficient and effective method of hydrating your mash and so mixing your crushed malt with hot water to start the conversion process at the beginning of the brewing. Above us is, you'll see there coming through the floor in sort of cone shape, is the bottom of the grist case. Now, the grist case is where the malt is stored uh, after it's been crushed, but before we actually start to brew with it. And interesting here, you'll see these bands on the side of the grist case, all of them with uh, hammered rivets in, um, and some angle design there to give it some strength. But all that special design and the angle specially measured to make sure the grain fell down at a good rate um, and more importantly that all the crushed malt would come out at the bottom and in the very bottom of the cone are two mixers that turn at quite slow speed 40 or 50 revs a minute and they've just got sort of fingers on them um, and they just gently turn so make sure that all that grain comes through and you can see as well that grist case is sat in basically a square of steel and you'll see just beyond there, another the cast iron column, again, supporting the weight. So lots of the iron being used in the construction supporting the weight. Above us here is a large hot water tank, large hot liquor tank. It contains 160 brewer's barrels of water when it's full up. And you can see how this is supported again on cast iron beams. Some of them going to the wall of the building, but again, a lot of the weight take on these cast iron columns. And you'll see in the distance, just beyond the, this mash tub, hopefully recognise another one of the depth gauges with that simple float and weight design to tell us what the contents of the tank are. As well as lots of timber used in the main construction of the brewer and indeed in some of the process plant itself, um, the access routes, the stairways, they're all obviously made of timber and looking at these banisters, even the amount of work involved in the banister, you can see this cross design, they've all got chamfered joints in there, 
Um, and this is replicated throughout the whole of the brewery. And again, it's that wooden design, here we are, this is the outside of the brewer's office. You can see that panelling design again there, and right through to the door. And say so this is throughout the whole of the building, so so much care and attention taken in not just the functionality, but also the workmanship and the presentation and the aesthetics of the building. So above us here is uh, what's called a teagle hoist, uh, basically a, a rope on a, a winch system. And this rope goes out into the uh, black and white lift shaft that we saw when we first looked at the outside of the brewery. We looked up, if you remember, running up to sort of two thirds of the height of the building. Um, and it's a simple rope system. Um, a chain would go around the neck of the sack and bring it up and then bring it into the level where it was needed. And just looking inside that uh, black and white lift hoist from the outside, uh, obviously not black and white on the inside, but you'll see the construction here is smooth on the inside. And again, this is to make sure that the path of the sacks of materials coming into the brewery was as clean as possible. And you see the rope hanging in the middle. And we will see this in action because it is still used on a weekly basis. select the uh, grain we want to use in a brew that's tipped into a hopper and then it needs to be taken up to the mill to be crushed and um, to be gently broken open before we can mix with hot water in the brew and so to move them up there it's basically a, a cups on a belt system sort of Jacob's ladder and you can see these metal cups on a belt and they'll, they'll spin around and pick up the grain coming out of a slide and take it up and uh, deliver it to the top of the mill. So the malt's coming up in those cups on the belt at that Jacob's ladder and it comes up to the top of the mill through the organ that you can see there running off the top and then into the wrist mill. Now this mill was installed and commissioned in 1899, a single biggest piece of machinery that the steam engine runs, built locally. You'll see there's a plate on the mill that says built in wantage in England and the grain is screened to take out any dust or foreign models or things we don't want and then it comes down to a nice clean stream through sets of rollers and into a hopper on the floor below and there are our metal rollers. Now an interesting point about this machinery is these pieces of metal at the front here, these large coiled springs and in fact that is exactly what they are. So we have two rollers in each set of the mills, there's two sets of rollers, actually have four rolls, and the gap between them is clearly what does the crushing bit as the grain passes through. So we do have the ability to move the front roller on both sets, we can move it away or we can move it closer, so we can adjust the gap between the rollers, which adjusts the fineness or coarseness, the degree to which the grains are going to be crushed which can be important because if you have a dry year, you may get smaller grains, uh, a wet year may be bigger grains. So we want to make sure they're being properly crushed for the brewing process. Um, and so that can be done by moving these. There's a, a sea spanner goes on here, and then we can just gently move in and out. We generally find you're not having to adjust them more than two or three times a year, and probably only by about an eighth, maybe a sixth of a turn, is enough just to really fine tune that grist that we're coming through. But again, such forethought in the design of the machinery to adapt to all of that. And again, typical throughout all of the line shafting and indeed the steam engine itself is lubrication is so, so important on these moving metal parts. And at every joint you'll see these grease caps here. So this cap will actually unscrew and then you can pack it full of grease and then you screw it back on on a thread. And as you're going through the days of work, you just gently nip it down and the grease will come out until it's empty. When you take it off, fill it with grease and, and go again. But this is a guard, so inside here there are some open gearings, but just look at the amount of workmanship here on the guard. This is made from, from metal and it's been riveted in here, far stronger and thicker than it needs to be. There's the modern bit on the bottom, which is just some mesh, but the amount of work in here, just in the guard, just on one piece of machinery, it is absolutely fascinating. They took such a pride in not just the functionality, not just the longevity, but also the aesthetics. And so proud of all the work that, and the workmanship that went into this. This is probably one of the most complex designed building parts of the whole brewery. And this is originally was an open work call. So after the work had been boiled up together, we had to cool it down before we could have the yeast. 
because obviously if yeast went into a boiling liquid, it's going to kill the yeast. So pumped up to here, and the idea was with a, a very low depth, very shallow depth and a big surface area, you would take some of that heat out and around the sides of this building are louvers. So there are louvers that could be opened. So you could open the louvers to bring the wind in and then you could open louvers higher up in the building. So we've got this almost turret at the top, again with louvers and you can see the metal rods um, and linkages that were there and pulley wheels that would allow you to open those louvers to allow the vapours out. So again, just controlling that, uh, that flow of vapours and cooling that work down. Again, the slates on this part of the building are not laid tightly together, there's a little gap in them. Um, but probably the most fascinating thing here is this really big steel structure above us of essentially tie beams holding that, uh, that roof structure together. And again, you think all of this was obviously designed, clearly designed off-site. All of that metal was fabricated, made off-site and brought here and bolted together. But it's a fascinating with these central bits here and the webs coming out. You've got eight, nine pieces coming out from each of these central points, um, just supporting this roof structure, supporting the louvers, so that it could do its job to cool the products down. So this roof structure again, just to finish it again, you can see this web in the corner where the roofs, I mean, it's the louvers that make the wall up. Uh, and then you'll see the tie bar coming out, actually threaded with a nut each side. So there's a, an allowance for, for tolerance here for movement and I guess when they were building it it just gave them that final bit of fine tuning to make sure that everything was sat square, sat nicely and sat firmly but again more metal that would have been cast uh, bespoke for this task. Now this cooler that we've looked at and um, you could probably notice it's made of copper but this is not original uh, from the 1900 Tower Bureau. the original one installed here was made cast iron it was actually slightly bigger than the copper one, it came right to the edge of these beams. So if you thought, this doesn't look like it fits properly, it doesn't quite fit properly. And apparently, this was, well, this was installed in 1954, and the workmen brought rolls of copper up on their shoulders, um, and there's a metal, there's a steel band here, and then basically they formed the copper around and brazed in situ. So it was actually made in situ, because one of the things of the Tower Brewery, clearly they're fantastic for showing the process in a logical way and using gravity as far as possible, but if you want to replace a piece of equipment, a new piece, and take an old piece out, you can't just take the roof off um, because you've usually got floors and floors above you. So the cast iron one here was cut down and taken out and then the copper one was actually formed in situ by coppersmiths. So just, just to finish, we're now looking down on the roof of that flat cooler we just looked at, and you'll see, looking closely very clearly, in fact, here you can see the gap between the slates to further allow the vapours to escape. And you can see as well on top, on the ridge, even the ridge tiles themselves are very decorative, that what's called Victorian pagoda style of architecture with the terracotta along the middle and then the, the particular detail on the ends of the building. It didn't need to be like that. It could have been plain ridge tiles, but no, they were so proud again of their design and really wanted to, to show it off and make it a spectacle. We are now at the top of the brewery and these are the two large cold water storage tanks that we saw when we were looking out from the ground right at the top of the brewery and in fact form the outside walls of this floor on three sides. And just to see here, the design here, so cast iron panels, each would have been weighing several hundred weight and this web design had obviously bolted together and say on three sides they're forming the actual outsides of the building so these would need to be hoisted up again hoisted up by hand with blocks and tackle and then bolted together to actually make that top floor of the building so the amount of workmanship involved is just uh, it really is breathtaking now looking out from the back of the road, so this is from the top we stood next to the cold water tanks we're looking at the chimney or one of the chimneys. There are two chimneys at the brewery, two big chimneys. One chimney is for the copper house and we looked at the coppers earlier and said about when they were coal fired. Um, but the bigger chimney, this chimney we're looking at now, is actually the boiler chimney. So steam was the source of uh, energy to run the steam engine, so to get our motor power. Uh, and steam was also the source of heating, so we could boil up uh, the, the, the brew. So this chimney came from when there were two coal-fired boilers. And this chimney was actually extensively rebuilt about 10 years ago. Um, very decorative, again, you'll see as we just go up to look at the very top of it, you see that design there, not just is there a brick chimney, 
preparing with I think now 16 individual stone sections actually capping the chimney. Um, and the chimney had fallen into a bad state of repair, so it was two thirds of it were taken down, and then every brick was hand cleaned, wire brushed, and then it was built right back up again, but with help from the Heritage Lockheed Fund. And so clearly it's a, it's a big structure, but performed a really important job. But again, it's just the decorative notes of it, it didn't need to be that decorative. And it's quite unusual, the majority of chimneys from around this time tend to be built round with, with metal bands around them. And you still see some of those in the areas of the northwest. And indeed, it's a round chimney on the uh, Bliss Tweed board at uh, nearby Chimney Hall. This boiler chimney nearly as high as the Brewery, so the smoke will be dissipated. 16 big blocks of stone on top of the chimney built of engineering bricks. And just in front of us, we're looking at a drain. Why are we looking at a drain, you say? Well, why did they put so much effort into making this lovely cast hopper? So we've got three black pipes leading in there, all overflows from the tanks above us into this hopper and down to the drain. But again, the amount of work involved in that. Yes, it's very functional, but there's a huge amount of metal there and someone had to make that and someone had to carry it up here. We talked about the columns when we started off first inside the building in the very bottom in that cellar. Uh, we looked at the size of the columns and uh, we're now on the third floor and cast iron column again in front of us. This is where the cast iron columns on top of each other actually finish. But you can hopefully see by looking at that, it's about half the diameter of the column that we saw on the ground floor. So as the building went up, they got narrower, but most of the weight was taken on these columns. So we're now in our fermenting room and these are round fermenting vessels uh, made of oak and uh, made in a barrel fashion. So in a circle and supported by metal bands and you can see there the adjustments on the bands so that you could tension or loosen them to hold the wood nice and tight together and to prevent any leaks. And what we're looking at here, this copper funnel, um, cold water flows through a cooling panel on all of our fermenting vessels. And by having it flow here and into this copper funnel, just enables you to check the temperature. You can either hold the pipe or just check the temperature of the water. Again, really, really simple, but the amount of workmanship, each of these copper funnels made, threaded onto a pipe and the copper bend here so that we could do that. But that was the design they wanted to do. And very efficient, very simple. As we've been walking around the main bureau, we've looked at some of the woodwork and the design on the banisters and the steps. Um, we're back in the copper house now because we're on our way down and clearly in the copper house where there were lots of vapours and um, before these vessels had lids on, on a brewing day you'd have a job to see in here. Clearly timber banisters, timber stairs in here would have not lasted very long. So they thought of that as well and the uh, banisters and railings in here were constructed from, from metal and you can see this very simple design. Um, but again, something else they thought of. Above us uh, is the old lift mechanism. So what used to be here was a lift that would take five metal, or five, originally five wooden barrels from this floor down to the cellar. So you can see where the belt drive was and moving across the controls and then the gearbox. So it was a Wagon and Company lift, well-known lift engineers from London. Um, so this lift was taken out about 20 years ago as there was a move towards smaller cask sizes. So we had to install more automation for the manual handling, but we've left the lift gear up here because of part of the history, but absolutely fascinating. And I can well remember this, this being used. So although we're coming to the end of this uh, short look around at the engineering and architecture brewery, um, we've come back to the very beginning and this building predates any of the brewing here. This was the original malt house where John Harris moved here. He said his farmhouse sat where the main brewery does now, and this was his malt house. Um, and still standing today, so this is from the early 1800s. And then we're going to go inside and just look at a few features of this. The malt house was expanded in 1865 with another wing added in a link building, and the living building was actually another kiln. And interesting, you see in front of us here there's a light well, so we're sort of half underground, but they dug a light well out to let some natural light in. And even in this industrial building, the arch above the window, that lovely detail of red and blue brick with a a stone keystone in the middle again. They really did want to make sure that this was not just a functional but a, a very pretty building. So we're actually inside what was the maltings now. And in the malting process, yeah. uh, grains are soaked up to a moisture content of about 45%, and then they're laid out on the floor 12 to 18 inches deep to gently start to germinate over a few days. And this was a malting floor. So the quarry tiles were actually sat on a layer of cement, on a layer of pitch, on a layer of timber. And clearly the pitch is there to try and waterproof from all the very wet grains and the wood you see in front of you is where boards would be slid in so that we could hold the content of the grain 
on the floors without it spilling out. And I would say that's still here today. And today, what was the original Malt House is our brewery shop. And we're now looking at one of the offshoots from the kiln. So the other side of this wall was a big kiln where the grains, once they germinated, would be gently roasted to dehydrate them and to put them into a stable condition from which they could be stored before they were used to make beer. And in front of you can see this is where the kiln would be um, offloaded down this slope and through the trap. So this is the floor above the molten floor we just looked at. And you can see looking up the, uh, these very impressive roof trusses with a, at the very top of the apex you have a metal shoe with the two um, joists running into it. And then you have the purlins and you have this lovely design but down at the bottom you also have the metal tie beams going out into the walls. So quite an unusual design of timber. Again, all there for a reason, um, but most impressive. And just a point of interest in here, we've now moved into the area that was the uh, original kiln, so where the grains were roasted. And you'll see, looking up, the purlins are not set at 90 degrees to the actual roof pitch. They're set vertically. And apparently this was because of the heat generated within the metal kiln that was uh, fired by coke that was within the building. And again, that was fairly typical of the design of the period. And we looked at the windows uh, from the outside on the lower levels where we looked at the light well and that lovely arching. Uh, we're now a floor above that and um, because we wanted to try and control the temperature of the molting process, you didn't want big windows letting lots of sunlight in. So you've got these quite small windows on, on this floor, which have been enough to allow ventilation, perhaps manage the humidity, but not so much that in a warm summer you have too much light coming through. And even the design of the brickwork as you move up to the lintel and above is, is, is quite fascinating. Just to show you sitting at the end of the roof structure again, how the, uh, the rafter sits down and sits in, uh, not just in the wall, but again within a metal shoe that's sat within a wall that's sat on top of a pad stone. And then you can see that wrought iron tie bar coming out of the timber as well.